Hello and welcome to this video for CE 108 Mechanics of Deformable Solids. We are still in chapter number two. In last video, for the beginning of this chapter number two, we saw an introduction to stress. So we defined stress as the intensity of a load per unit of surface. And we saw a more mathematical definition of stress. We said that in a two dimension, there is a free stress that matters. If you want to define the state of stress in two dimension, you need to give first the normal stress along X, the normal stress along Y, sigma Y, and you need to define the shear stress. And as a reminder, as we, what we saw in the previous video is that in two dimension, there is only one type of shear stress, the shear stress applied on the left and on the right is the same as the shear stress applied at the top and bottom. So we simply write it to. And so we said last time that, for example, the mathematical definition of the shear stress is the limit when the surface becomes very small of the small force divided by the surface over which this force is applied. In practice, nevertheless, we don't use this definition. We don't have to calculate limits when we want to calculate the stress within a member. So what we are going to see in this video is some more simplified definition of stresses, uh, both for the normal stress and for the shear stress. So the first case that we are going to consider is the average normal stress that develops to a member that is subjected to an actual load. So for this, let's consider um, a cylinder like this. And so let's assume that this cylinder is subjected to a normal actual load that is along the, the that is orthogonal to the, the direction of the member. And so we are going to simplify to assume that this member is homogeneous and isotropic. So in this case, homogeneous means that the property of the this member do not depend on the position. So for example, the, if this member is made of a given material like steel, concrete, plastic, wood, etc., we are going to assume that the properties do not depend on the material, on the position of the material within the material. So for example, if you have now a reinforced concrete where you have concrete that is reinforced by some steel, then this assumption would not be true because in this case, the steel and the concrete have different properties. So in this case, the, the properties of the material would be different as a function of the position. So that uh, in this case, we are not considering these types of composite materials. We are considering materials that are homogeneous, where the properties are the same everywhere throughout the member. And then we are also considering that this material is isotropic, which means that in this case, the property do not matter, do not depend on the direction along which you are looking. For example, in the case of wood, if you look at the properties of wood along the direction of the fibers within the wood or orthogonals to the fiber within the wood, the property would be different. So in this case, that would be an example of a material that is not isotropic. So in this case, to simplify, we are considering the case where the material is homogeneous and isotropic. So properties do not depend on the position, but also do not depend on the direction. So then uh, let's assume that we are going to um, cut this material uh, somewhere. So we are going to use the method of section. We isolate, for example, the, the bottom part of this um, of this member. So if we isolate the bottom part, and so we are going to define A, where A is going to be the, the cross section. So cross section, the cross section of the material is if you take this material along its, um, uh, you, you take this material like this, where you, you, you define the, the surface over which the load will be transmitted throughout the materials, that's the cross section. That's the cross section that is orthogonal to the longitudinal axis of the, of the material. So this is the, the cross section. This is the, the section over which the load is applied. And so we are going to write A, the area of the cross section. So now if we zoom in, 
on the bottom part so we have the bottom part like this we have the load end that is applied at the bottom and then we have the the cross section here which is the interface between the top and the bottom part of the um, of this cylinder so now if we look at the detail of how the load that is applied at the top is transmitted to the bottom so the load is acting as a fixed support to the bottom and so the the reason why a load is transmitted is because at each point of the interface between the top and the bottom there is a small force that is being transmitted so if we look at the detail of what happened at the surface at each point of the surface between the top and the bottom there is a small force we can write this force dn that is transmitted by the top to the bottom so now if the material is homogeneous if the material is isotropic and if this section is uh, far enough from the points where the load are being applied so probably in this case you have a load applied at the top and a load applied at the bottom so if you are far away from those points at which the load are applied then we can assume that the force that is applied by the top to the bottom is going to be uniform that is to say that dn will be the same everywhere along this cross section you will not have certain point of this cross section where uh, the end would be larger so the force will be uniformly distributed throughout the entire cross section so now if we want to define the 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 shear the normal stress so we, let's define now the the normal stress within uh, this member so we are going to apply the the definition of the normal stress the normal stress is the load per unit of surface here since the load is uniformly distributed since dn is the same everywhere we can define now the average normal uh, normal stress and in this case the average normal stress can be defined as followed so normal stress would be defined as the load divided by the area since in this case the uh, load is the same everywhere we can define the total load divided by the total area in this case since we know that this body has to be at equilibrium we know that the total load the total sum of all the dn must be equal to n for the body to be at equilibrium so then we can define the average normal stress as the total normal load divided by the total area of the cross section over which the load is applied so in practice uh, this is how we are going to define the the normal stress we are not going to use the definition with the limit we are going to simply in most cases assume that the metal is homogeneous isotropic so that we can calculate so that the force will be the same everywhere throughout the cross section so that we can simply define the average normal stress as the ratio of the normal load divided by the area the, the the sign convention remain the same so the sign convention is the same as the one that we previously showed so if you have a cylinder like this with a force like this then that's going to be a positive stress that is going to induce a tension or the result is going to be an elongation and on the other hand if you have uh, a force like this that's going to give you uh, a negative normal stress that's going to give you a compression and that's going to give you uh, a shrinkage the size of the material is going to decrease so that's going to be in this case the negative sign convention for the normal stress so now let's consider the case of the shear stress so for this we are going to consider the case of a member like this that is attached to a fixed support on the left so it's going to be attached to a fixed support like this on the left and it's uh, subjected to a shear force on the right and uh, going a shear force going up 
on the right. So same thing. Now, if you want to calculate the shear stress somewhere inside this material, we need to define a section. So we are going to define the cross section. Again, the cross section here is the section that is orthogonal to the longitudinal axis. That's the, the surface over which the load will be transmitted throughout the member. And same thing, we are going to isolate either the left or the right. So in this case, let's for example, let's assume that we isolate the left, um, the left part of this member. So now if we look at um, uh, what happens, what is the force applied by the right to the left in this case? So let's zoom in on this uh, right part that we um, isolated. So the member is still attached to a fixed support on the left and on the right. So this point here correspond, uh, is uh, corresponds to this. So this is the, the, the right interface that we are uh, virtually cutting here. And so if we look at what happens, so the, the right part is attached to the left part. So the right part acts as a fixed support for the left. And because those two uh, surfaces are attached, then there's going to be an internal load and this internal load in this case is going to be a shear force. If we look at the detail of what happened uh, at the interface, every point of the interface on the right will be transmitting a small force on the left. So at each point of this interface, the right part will be attached to the left and hence will be transmitting a small force. So now again, we are going to assume that this material is homogeneous and uh, isotropic. And we are going to assume that the cross section that we are defining in is far away from the points where the external load is applied. So that again, we can assume that those small shear force, and this time we can write those shear force as dV, those shear force can be considered as uniform. They are the same throughout the entire cross section. That's because the metal is homogeneous and isotropic. So now let's see what it means in terms of the, the shear stress. So we are going to define in the very same way that we define the average shear, the normal stress. Now we are going to define the average shear stress. So we are going to write this too. And because the shear stress is the, the shear load divided by the area over which it is applied. So we are going to define it in the same way. We are going to write the cross section of the area A. And because in this case, DV is uniform, the stress is equal to the load per unit of surface. And since the, the, the load is uniformly distributed throughout the surface, the stress is also equal to the total load divided by the total surface. For this body to be at equilibrium, then we know that necessarily you, you have the same force V that is applied on the left and on the right for this body to be at equilibrium so that the shear stress is going to be defined as the total load. The total load is the sum of all the small dV and the, sm the sum of all the small dV will be equal to the total V for the body to be at equilibrium and you divide by the surface over which it is applied. So that's going to be in practice the definition that we are using for the shear stress is going to be the total shear load divided by the total area of the cross section over which this load is applied. So that's going to be our definition for the shear stress. Again, the sign convention for the shear stress that we will be using is that a positive shear stress will be defined like this, or if the force is applied at the top and bottom like this, that is going to be the uh, con convention for positive shear stress, while a negative shear stress, the forces will be applied in the opposite direction.